everyone. My name is Miguel Myers. Welcome to My Horror Confessional, where every week I'll have a guest come on and talk about one classic horror movie that they haven't seen and why. We'll discuss the movie, the actors, and probably get off topic quite a bit. Once I believe they have properly atoned, I will absolve them of their horror movie sin. Today, we have Mike Brown, one half of the People Under the Scares podcast uh, with Bobby Torres, aka Bobby Likes It Spooky, who was a previous guest. We love Bobby in this household. And he is also one quarter of the YouTube podcast, Scream Kings. Mike, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. You got Scream Kings in there, too. Yes, of I, course. I forgot I was going to have to bring that up. <laughs> of course. We're all about the plugs here. I want to make sure <laughs> everything. And actually, most recently, Mike was a guest on our Halloween trivia Patreon-only yes. episode. Um, well, actually, the video was Patreon only, but we released it as a Halloween treat to give you guys a little bit, of, a little taste of what's happening over on the Patreon. Mike, that was so much fun to have you on that show. It was great. It was a good time. It had it forced me to use my brain. I was a little upset at the end, but still, again, congrats, <laughs> Renee. Congrats. To you. Yes, Renee from Podmore, from Podmore, <laughs> ended up winning. Um, and. Uh, who else was on there? So Anthony Jerome was my guest host for that episode, and he was also yes. in charge of the points. <laughs> and we also had a, a Patreon subscriber Kent Morton on there, and uh, JP from Podmortem as well, and yeah. and of course uh, Bobby. And Bobby, yeah. So that was just I, a great time. I knew. I just knew. I've only seen Sleepaway Camp one time all the way through and i knew that would haunt me i knew it <laughs> because it, it is anthony jerome <laughs> favorite horror movie and uh so i had to throw that in there for him <laughs> so mike um tell me a little bit about the people under the scares podcast yeah so that's obviously with me and bobby torres and it's essentially a horror lovers podcast who will do horror movie reviews We'll also have themed episodes, like our next episode is going to be our most hated characters in horror. And um, it's not as quite as shady as the last episode of Terrifier 2 we did, but I did have a few people Bobby was not happy about on my, li <laughs> on my list. But we just like to have a good time. Yeah, you guys have a great time. Y'all cut it up. Y'all had a, an episode on Final Boys. Yes. I think that I love. That was great because everybody's talking about Final Girls. I always talk about Final Girls and we don't really talk about Final Boys. And that was a really interesting episode to listen to. It was fun and it was hard to kind of really find enough to have an award show. Yeah, that's true. But y'all did it? We did. We did. Yeah. And we're actually, he's probably not going to want to, but I'm going to try to get him to do a Final Girl Awards. Uh -huh. But I know that's going to be a lot. We're going to be arguing a lot of that episode. <laughs> Uh, to be fair, I think you're more argumentative than Bobby <laughs> is. You be starting shit. I do. I do. <laughs> yeah, you shady. You shady. Uh, and that's what's up with um, Scream Kings then? Scream Kings. That's also with Bobby, and then we have Tamon Kane and Marco Estes. It's uh, four black queer men uh, who love horror movies, and we have themed episodes each week. Uh, we just had creature features. This past week come out, and there's other ones like Nightmare on Elm Street, which is Mark's favorite franchise, Taman's is Scream, which will be later, and you know Bobby's is Halloween, so he did a Halloween episode. That's my it's boy. Basically, my boy. yeah. So we just, basically, it's a good time. We play little drinking games while we're uh, going through it. We play games afterwards. We discuss the franchises, and to be clear, I'm argumentative on our podcast, but it isn't just me on Scream King. <laughs> And that's that's on the YouTube, right? Yes, it is on YouTube. And it's every Wednesday at 8 p.m. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about you. So what is your history with horror? Have you always loved it? Have, have you grown into it? Uh, like, did you have family that loved it? That sort of thing. So I had to have had family because they basically tell a story of me trying to coerce my aunt into watching Child's Play with me because I assumed I was scared. But I've always watched horror movies. I just don't know the exact point when I started watching it. Okay. So they must have been watching it with me there. And then I just kind of picked up 
on my own eventually. And then, you know, Blockbuster every week, I'd be renting horror movies, being scared of shit. <laughs> then, you know, Blockbuster closed. And so I would have to try to find stuff to watch on TV or buy the DVDs, mm-hmm. which my mother, I think, sold my DVDs, but I'm going to leave that alone. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She got religious after a while oh, and then didn't want the DVDs oh, in her house man, and they disappeared. So much. That sucks. <laughs> that hurts. Well, there were DVDs though, right? So you would have had to upgrade to Blu-rays at, at, at a given point. But still, that was your shit, yeah. right? Don't touch your it shit. It was. It was. Yeah. I'm going to get her. I'm going to see what <laughs> of hers I can sell. <laughs> And so, uh, did you have a, a friend group as well growing up that, that liked horror movies with you or... or? No, actually, I kind of just watched it on my own or with family. I don't thinking about. It, I don't think I had a friend group that loved horror movies like that. Okay. I might have gone with people to the movies to see like Paranormal Activity, but it was never like a core group of people who liked horror. That was around the time where we were just drinking and going out and shit. So it was yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't us getting together to watch horror movies. It wasn't until uh, you know COVID hit. And I started engaging more with people online. I started to find like a community of people who really liked horror. And now, and then I became obsessive. And then I was like, you know what? I like talking about this other people. And now I can't shut up. That's so interesting because I, I've talked to, well, for example, like Pod Mortem, they also came out of the pandemic as well because they were bored at home and had nothing to do. And, you know, they, they weren't working at the time. So they started up a podcast. Uh, myself, I got really into podcasts, like horror podcasts around that time, especially when I found other or black horror creators and other people of color horror creators. When I found that, I was like, oh, I can do this also, you know? So yeah. it just seems like while the pandemic was absolutely horrible, uh, <laughs> there was some positivity that came out of it. And it was this like kind of, black and people of color, like horror community that sprung up, uh, either that sprung up or was revealed to me because just right. because I didn't know it was there. doesn't mean it didn't exist, but, but yeah, that's, that's really, that's really great to hear. Um, and how you guys have been doing the podcast now for, has it been over a year? Um, we hit a little over a year. Well, yeah, it's been over a year. I think we started October 8th. Around that okay. day. I didn't really celebrate or anything, but <laughs> it was around I, that time frame. I'm the same. Yeah, yeah. Well, congratulations on hitting a year. Thank how, you. How do you think that the what, what do you feel about the community, like the the people of color and the black like horror community that has kind of sprung up around these movies and podcasts and stuff? Uh, well, like you touched on, I think there was just like a disconnection, maybe. And I think we all kind of got excited to see black people and people of color who are also interested in this. So you you want to build on that. You want to build more of a community. You want to watch more movies. I stay stalking everybody to try to find more um, <laughs> more uh, recommendations, yeah. which, by the way, I'm glad you hit me up because I would have never watched this movie, even though I saved it on my queue. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a great time getting to know everybody. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I, I it's just been one of the pleasures of doing this podcast is meeting other like minded individuals, other people of color who who love this as much as I do. Because when I was growing up, uh, it was a very singular kind of pursuit in in my experience, and but also like not seeing a lot of people that looked like me mm-hmm. in in represented in the movies or even in the. Uh, media talking about horror movies. So I, I, I absolutely love it now. So, well, that's great to hear. So um, we kind of got a little bit of background on you and your horror stuff. What's your, what, what did you say your favorite genre was? I'm sorry, your uh, favorite franchise? My, ugh, okay. I, um, I see you rocking the Michael Myers shirt. I is, am. Oh, so this is, it's complicated. <laughs> so... <laughs> If I had to pick one, it would be Nightmare on Elm Street. Okay. And Freddy is my favorite villain, but I don't find him scary. Michael Myers, to me, is the scariest. Okay. But I I prefer to watch Nightmare on Elm Street. Okay. The the whole series? Or let's break it down to the original (laughs) movies themselves. Um, Okay. I liked one. I don't like how they killed him off in one. Okay. Um, Two was... Meh. 
as far as the ending. I, I'll, you know what? I do like them all. I'll watch them, but there's definitely Dream Warriors, Dream Master, and the original that I prefer. Well, yeah. you know, sorry to interrupt you, but you know that we had a somebody from Dream Child in this movie. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we did. The queen herself, Kelly Joel Minter. Mm-hmm. She was Cheryl in this movie, and she was in uh, Dream Child. She was uh, Yvonne in Dream Child, which she survived. Yeah, and, and she was, a- I'm, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but she was actually Ruby from The People Under the Stairs. That's right. <laughs> which y'all got your name from. So was, I thought you did it on purpose. No, I didn't do it on purpose. Okay, cool. Well, well, let's get into it. So Mike is here to confess his sin of never having watched Popcorn from 1991. Is that correct? That is correct. All right, cool. So why do you think this particular movie passed you by? Like you said, it was on your list for a while, but you hadn't actually pressed play on it. So why do you think that was? Uh, So you know the cover is very captivating. It has a cover that you want to watch. So That's a dope-ass cover. it. It is. And like it would be one if you went to the video store, you would stop and look. Mm. But there's so much shit on right now. That I just, I, I, it's so overwhelming. And I have to catch up on a lot. So it just kind of kept getting pushed to the back. Okay. I feel that. I and feel that. Like, I'll eventually get to it. So the only reason why I've saw I've seen this movie before, I saw it like this past week to record. I saw it at a horror movie marathon, which is funny, right? Because Ooh. this movie, but I saw it at uh, it's something called uh, Dismember the Alamo, which is here in uh, Austin, Texas at the Alamo Draft House where they have it every year and it's like uh they play like four or five movies and uh, so i saw it there like maybe in 20 2019 wow yeah okay. 2019 and it was so much fucking fun i was like i so, i was so surprised i had never heard of it uh and then so when i was making the list for the for the show i had to throw it on there and then you chose this one between, and there was a couple other movies like two other movies that you chose but you chose popcorn, and I was like, "No, yes. we definitely. I want to talk about <laughs> popcorn." I think one of the other ones had chainsaw hookers in the title. That's really the only reason I chose it. Okay, all right. Uh, well, I can't wait to talk about that one with somebody. But, <laughs> but yeah, so popcorn from nineteen ninety one. So let's get into it. So there was two directors of the movie. There was. Alan Ormsby, he uh, um, he has directed movies like The Substitute. Actually, I'm sorry. Um, he wrote The Substitute and Cat People from the from the 80s, the 80s version. Oh. And he also had a writing credit on Disney's Mulan, which was very weird to me. And then what? the other director was Mark Harrier uh, or Arrier. And this was actually his only full length directed movie. Um, and the screenplay for uh, Popcorn was also written by Alan Ormsby. Uh, Alan was was fired and, and Mark Aria was brought on to complete the film. Uh, and then it was starring Jill Sholin, uh, who plays Maggie. She was she starred in When a Stranger Calls Back, uh, The Stepfather and Cutting Class. So she's kind of like a little a final girl herself. Okay. Um, it's also starring Tom Villard as Toby. He was in My Girl and Heartbreak Ridge. Uh, he was absolutely great in this movie as Toby. Like I thought he did an amazing job. Um, sadly, Tom passed away in November of 94 from AIDS-related pneumonia, which is just an absolutely terrible thing to hear um, because he was so... Uh, so talented. You know, mm-hmm. I felt like I felt like he really could have done a lot more stuff, especially in the horror genre. Um, so rest in peace, Tom Villard. Um, and also starring our queen, D. Wallace, playing Suzanne. Huge surprise. I had yeah. no idea she was in this movie. <laughs> With the short, short hair this time. Yes. Like short 80s hair. Um, and she was in, obviously, she, she was in The Hills Have Eyes, which me and Anthony Jerome M. did in our um, My 70s Confessional. Obviously, she was in E.T., Cujo, The Howling, Critters. Like, she's a queen. Right. She's up there with Jamie Lee Curtis, you know? Very much so. Uh, and then as we spoke about earlier, Kelly Jo Minter, she was played Cheryl. She was Ruby 
from the people under the stairs, Yvonne from uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 5, Dream Child. She was Maria from Lost Boys. And for y'all who don't remember, she was LaDonna in House Party. Uh, I don't know if y'all remember the house party, but she was LaDonna in that. That's what when Martin just calls her a bitch and she says, your mama's a bitch. No room. Where am I supposed to sit? She gonna walk. She, get out. She's gonna walk. No, she's gonna walk. Why? Excuse me one minute. Yes, babe. Uh-uh, I don't even appreciate how you're treating me. I'm real sorry, babe. I do appreciate the way you look, though. Yo, um, no, 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 babe, go for it. No. What else can I do? Come here. Kick that bitch to the curb and let me ride with my equipment. I'm the DJ, man. Bitch? Who are you calling a bitch? Your mama's a sorry bitch. Hey, my mama ain't no bitch. If I'm a bitch, your mama's a bitch. Hey, I'll kick your ass. Hey, I'll fight a girl. All right, all right, all right, all right. right. Listen, man, listen, man. I can't do that. No, no, you ain't. No, you ain't. Okay, I can't both y'all answers. Don't do that shit. Play. Don't play. Oh, my God. It's I just it's them. crazy wa- going watching these movies and then going back and seeing other movies these people have been in that you didn't know about. Yeah, where you click. Yeah, she. I mean, she was. I mean, she was uh, another like this movie. And there's other um, cast members in here that I'm not highlighting that were in other horror me- movies that were great that people know of. So this cast has a great horror pedigree. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's amazing. And also, she was in a different world. I had to mention. I love a right. different world. One of the best sitcoms ever. Um, all right, so let's get into the movie. So the movie starts very quickly. We see a bunch of latex faces floating in water. Then the title card appears, Popcorn. It's such a great movie, uh, such a great title for a movie because it perfectly encapsulates what this movie is. And it's just a popcorn movie. Just turn your mind off. Sit back, relax. You're going to be entertained. The plot's not going to make much sense. There's going to be a lot of plot holes. But who gives a fuck? Like, yes, this movie came out in 1990, but this feels like an 80s slasher movie. It does. It, it's that era of the 90s where, I don't know what happened. It was like, we had the 80s, and then the 90s, I guess they wanted to try to do something different, but it still kind of felt like an 80s movie. Right. And this was in that era. It's like, uh, well, Anthony Jerome said in uh, one of our episodes where we do a um, My 2K confessional um, show on, on our Patreon where we go over like mid-2000s movies because I don't really like the mid-2000s and he does. <laughs> and he said in our most recent episode we did on um, Silent Hill, he said that the, the, the 90s didn't end until 2006. <laughs> <laughs> because there's a lot of fashion and a bunch of shit that carried over <laughs> from the 90s into 2006. Specifically, he was talking about Cheryl, or I forget the, the main character, the blonde chick, walking around with her um, cell phone on a chain around her neck. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, I, was like, I was like, what the hell is that? He said, that's from the 90s. I was like, I, I forgot don't... about <laughs> That is so true, though. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, I, I think the decades, even though it's 91, I think we were still full on 80s, like you're mm-hmm. saying. And and so, like, we this definitely felt like an 80s vibe. Like, if I were to, if we were to throw this on and nobody tells me when it came out, I'd think 86, exactly. 87, you know, something like that. So, yeah. And uh, so I just want to say I love the title uh, of this movie. I think it's it's great. But. So then the scene fades into Maggie's bedroom. She's sleeping. And um, I did notice that we went from all the faces that were floating in the water to all the faces she had on her uh, on her wall. Yes. She had like posters and pictures and, and kind of like you got going on behind you. You got a lot of pictures <laughs> going on behind you. Mike. It's a little bit creepy. I got like 12 eyes looking back at you. It was intentional. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> Um, so we, we see images of her nightmare explosions, her as a little girl, a weird looking man. Uh, I'm sorry, a weird looking man with his, like his head is on the table. Like it's on a food platter. Um, there's fire. Then the head on the table turns into a skull. And then we see her, her as a child running away, Mm -hmm. a woman yelling out, Sarah, a man standing above her as a child, uh, with a sword. But before he could swing it down, her alarm clock goes off and then she wakes up. So that's basically the plot of the movie right there, or <laughs> the twist of the movie right there, right? So she reaches for a tape recorder and describes her dream to it. Downstairs, we see Ms. D. Wallace herself, 
Suzanne in this movie. Uh, and her haircut is even 80s, like I would think, Very. you know, like shortcut 80s, right? Um, and she's Maggie's mom. A phone call comes in and she picks it up and she, she says hello a couple times, but no one responds. Finally, a creepy sounding voice says, Miss Julius, remember who the ninth circle of hell is reserved for and then hangs up. So I wanted to ask you a question. Do you know what the ninth circle of hell is? <laughs> I fucking knew you were going to ask this. I knew. <laughs> this is trivia. Trivia never ended, Mike. Right? <laughs> while watching it, I was like, what is... I, I don't know. <laughs> but but watching well, it... I, I will be 100% truthful with you. I didn't know what it was either, you know? So I looked it up, and it's from uh, Dante's Inferno, which is okay. a, a, a famous um, book that was written in the Roman times or whatever. And there was nine circles of hell. And I wanted to go through them real quick. And then I wanted to say what the ninth Ooh. one was. So the first circle, and, and this is all from the book. This isn't like in the Bible. Uh, I'm atheist, but I don't want anybody to think that this was found in the Bible. Um, so there's the first circle is limbo. Second, lust. Third, gluttony. Fourth, greed. Fifth, anger. Sixth, heresy. Seventh is violence. And so they're getting worse to worse, or at least to worse. Uh, eighth is fraud. And ninth is treachery. So let me tell you about treachery. This is the deepest circle of hell where Satan resides. Where the money resides? No, where Satan resides. <laughs> As with the last two circles, this one is further divided into four rounds. The first is Cana, named after the biblical Cain, who murdered his brother. Uh, this round is for traitors to family. The second, Antonera, an, uh, Antinora, from Antinor of Troy, who betrayed the Greeks, is reserved for political and national traitors. So we all know mm. a couple of people who can go <laughs> to the ninth circle of hell. Uh, the third is Ptolemaea, for Ptolemy, son of Abubus, who is known for inviting Simon Maccabeus and his sons to dinner and then murdering them. This round is for hosts who betray their guests. They are punished more harshly because of the belief that having guests means entering into a voluntary relationship and betraying a relationship willingly entered is more despicable than betraying a relationship born into. This is very, very it, specific. Yes. Yeah. It's interesting, actually. Yeah. And so the fourth round is Judeca after Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Christ. This round is reserved for traitors to their lords, benefactors, or masters. As in the previous circle, the subdivisions each have their own demons and punishments. So I would think that he is talking about this fourth round here, Judeca, because as we'll find out later, they uh, he was the person that is calling was their quote unquote master, mm -hmm. right? So that's what he means by that's what they mean by the second, the ninth circle of hell. Now you got to now you got to remember that, Mike. Yeah, like, trivia. I swear baby. to you, if you were ever on another round of trivia, <laughs> Mike, it's gonna come up. I'm I'm say, I'm giving you the warning now, Mike. I'm go I'm gonna write the first. I'm gonna have <laughs> cheat codes under my computer. When we do okay. This. <laughs> All right. Cool. So uh, then the person hangs up. Maggie then comes downstairs and grabs some OJ and continues to describe her dream into the recorder. Suzanne asks Maggie why she named her character Sarah, but Maggie says she doesn't know. We see that Maggie is using her dreams to write a script for a horror movie. Next, we see Maggie driving into the campus of the University of California at Ocean View. Uh, as she runs to class, she continues to talk into the recorder when she runs into Mark. Or should I say his lips run into her? And like Mark, uh, Mark starts like kissing her, and uh, and I don't know. Did it look consensual to you that kiss? Obviously, like he, it wasn't consensual because he like right. stole a kiss basically. But was she reciprocating the kiss afterwards, or did it didn't? Look uh, it, I don't know. It, it didn't look consensual, but it looked. I mean, granted, this was also a time where people were not. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Because it it, it it wasn't, but she kind of just went along with it until he kind of was like pushing it to She was like, no, I don't want to do all of that now. You already got a kiss. No, yeah, <laughs> leave yeah. me alone. It seemed like they were, they knew each other, but from that kiss, I would have thought, in fact, in my notes, I said like, uh, gets a kiss from her boyfriend. But then afterwards, when they started talking, I'm like, oh, wait, right. that is not her boyfriend. 
Uh, but so Mark begs her to go to his place to have sex with him. And she says, uh, Mark, this is the age of safe sex and sex with him is not safe. So uh, Man, what does that mean? Yeah. I mean, he sounds very rapey. And then I think throughout the movie, they kind of like they, they set him up in the very beginning to be a douchebag asshole. And as the movie progresses, he goes through certain things and injuries to make him less so. He becomes like a buffoon. Right. To the point where we end up maybe liking him at the end, depending on, you know, how you view it. They try to do the whole Halloween thing with uh, Allison's boyfriend. I wasn't feeling it. You weren't feeling it? No. Okay. <laughs> you, you weren't feeling Halloween kills either? I liked Halloween kills. Okay. All right. Okay. Oh, oh Allison's boyfriend from Halloween. Uh... Oh, no. Oh. I'm sorry. Halloween ends. Ends, I was saying. You didn't like Halloween ends? I did like Halloween ends. As controversial as that might be, I did like Halloween ends. I liked it, too. Um, you know, it was a, it was different. Yeah, I probably would have liked that storyline in a different, maybe in the second movie. And they, do I had to say, I third. completely understand. I had the same thing. Me and uh, AJM talked about it, and we kind of came to to the same conclusion. But all right, I can talk about Halloween uh, <laughs> ends for hours, but I'm gonna move on. So he says he wants to be boyfriend and girlfriend but she says she's not she's not interested and she's concentrating on her script right now and she doesn't want to be distracted which is like good for you you know mm-hmm. she knows what the fuck she wants she's in school uh she's not trying to get tied down to anything so she's very um career oriented which is great to see i did notice something else about her i was wondering if they wanted Winona Ryder in this as the Mm -hmm. character because she looks a lot like her and she's dressed up like Lydia in Beetlejuice. So I don't know if that was on purpose. Okay. (laughs) And Beetlejuice would have already come out, right? Because it was like 89, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can see that. Mark says he just hopes he's still around when she's ready and then he jogs off. I was like, okay, dude. Fuck (laughs) fuck all the way off, Mark. Like, I think Maggie will be okay. Like, she's fine. She's going to be okay. So now we are now inside a classroom. Tina, we just met Tina. She's breaking down the news for the film department. They've lost their editing space. They were in the library, the biology lab, and the music room. And now they're being kicked out of that as well. And I'm thinking, these film nerds get no respect. Uh, then they ask what they need to do to, to get some respect. And then they all shout out that they need to kick some ass, which is kind of weird. <laughs> Like, this feels like a gang more than, like, a class or a, yeah. a, a department, you know? This was very 80s to me, by the way. Them just revealing all the characters we're going to be dealing with. in one Right off the bat, like, in one room, yeah. So then their teacher, Mr. Davis, informs them that they're a novelty item and that they need to make a splash to get on the map. And I was thinking, I don't think that's how education is supposed is, to work. No. <laughs> but honestly, like maybe, because who knows with like schools and like public schools or whatever this or in the United States, who the fuck knows, right? Because like we all know that, especially like I'm in Texas, football. like football gets all the love and gets all the money and then like theater gets nothing and that sort of thing, you know, so. Um, so then Mr. Davis tells them that Toby has an idea for how to make that splash. <sighs> I forgot about that. Yeah. It was Toby's idea. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm not going to say that this movie was like genius, but on a second watch, some stuff starts to fall in place, you know? So Toby, steps, uh, Toby steps up to the front after Joni gives him a round of applause. And so we we see that she has a crush on him. And and he says his idea, an all-night horror marathon or horathon which is my absolute dream. I've dreamed of putting on a horror yeah. movie marathon, you know? So Mr. Davis tells him that it's a great idea that they make a lot of money. So Bud, who's an asshole who happens to be in a, in a wheelchair, like makes fun of the idea and uh, they all kind of laugh at it. But then uh, Davis quips, these are the future writers and directors of American cinema. And then Toby says, it's the police Academy syndrome which I didn't quite get. I think it was a diss, a dig at them. Like maybe if they liked P- police Academy, did you ever watch any of the police Academy movies? I did. Um, there used to be one. Now I can't tell them apart, but there was one where there was like the cops versus the criminals. And they're in like a warehouse. And the guy who makes mimics the voices, he pretends to be a robot and is fighting some guy off. I don't know. I think it's part four. 
Okay, all but right. But I did like some of them. I just yeah. don't really know which was which. You know, like Police Academy is kind of like scary movie. Like the first two are good, and then they kind of log and then she returns <laughs> on it. You know, I think I saw up to the one in Miami. I don't think I saw the Miami. I might have, but and it's the '80s. Like the Police Academy was huge in the '80s. You can't, yeah, you couldn't miss them. You know. Uh, so then Leon, another student there, takes offense to this and says, there's more social relevance and character development in P- Police Academy 5 than in all of Igmar Bergman's cinematic smorgasbord. And I thought, OK, like w- so I actually tackled Hour of the Wolf earlier this year with Johnny Compton, which is a it's an Ingmar Bergman movie. And I can agree that there was not a lot of character development there. But like, seriously, I think he's being more of a troll. I think he's being a bit facetious. Yeah, at least academy you know. in comparison. Yeah. <laughs> in comparison to like the seventh CO, which is one of the best movies ever made. So anyway, a fun fact I had here is that the director of this movie was actually the star of the 80s sex romp trilogy, Porky's. So have you ever saw Porky's? Uh, like he was the, the star. Of, yeah, he was the star of those three, and so he actually was the director of this movie too. So I just thought that was what kind of the funny. Fuck? There. <laughs> yeah, Porky's is absolutely terrible trash now. Like it's co- completely problematic. It's like making sexual assault funny and like all, terrorizing women and all that, and yeah. making fun of it's like uh, homophobic and like transphobic and all this sort of stuff. Uh, and I'm sure, like Police Academy was too. If like it, I haven't seen it in t- two decades, so don't I cancel think me. All of our I movies. I think yeah. all of our movies around that time frame is just not. <laughs> just and like, I'm not gonna lie, there are some movies that are horrible. That I still laugh at. There are. Um, scary movie possibly is offensive to quite a few people, but it's still yeah. fucking funny. Yeah, there's like some anti-trans stuff in there in mm-hmm. and Scary Movie, which I had completely forgot about it until I watched it like in October with my wife who had never seen it. I was like, ooh. Oh, wow. wow. That, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. That didn't, that didn't really uh, age very well. So then uh, they nerd, they film nerd out a bit. They talk about a little bit of um, some films and stuff like that. And then we finally meet Cheryl, uh, Kelly Jo Mentor. She's looking absolutely amazing. Um, and asks, and she asks, what makes them think that people will pay six dollars to see some crappy old movies they wouldn't even rent for ninety nine cents? And Davis says because they can't see Mosquito in Projecto Vision at home. And Toby holds up a great vintage fifties looking poster with a couple running away from a huge mosquito. And then he says, nor can they watch the stench in Odoroscope. And Toby <laughs> corrects Davis and says, it's Aroma Rama. And then the poster says, they couldn't believe their eyes. You won't believe your nose. I love it. Automatically, I love it. I really want to go to something like this. Because I heard that, what is it, 4DX or something like that, where it's more interactive. I want to go to something like that. My brother told me about that. He went, uh, it was one of the Marvel movies. I don't remember which one. And like it. It's like you're on a little roller coaster, like your seat moves and like if water splashes, it'll it'll mist water on your face and that sort of stuff. But it's like twenty four dollars a ticket or something like that. You know, I'm like, oh, I'm, no, I'm OK. Lie. I'm OK. Yeah. yeah, I'll bring my own mister. <laughs> <laughs> you know? They didn't say don't they didn't say don't bring those in. Yeah, That's exactly. Food. And so finally they show the he says the attack of the amazing electrified man in Shackascope. And he says, that's why people will pay $10. Uh, I would pay $24 for this, though. Three movies with all Three. this with yeah. all this shit. Hell yeah. In, in, in a second. $10. I'm trying to think. 1991, how much movie tickets? Oh, are. let's do it. Let's do it. Um, inflation calculator. Because <laughs> she said $6. I was like. So this is, let's say 1991. If I purchase something for $6 in 2022, it would be $13.13. So $10, right? He's saying $10. $21. So that's sounds about, about... Sounds about right. Yeah, that's about what I would pay. But yeah, a triple feature. And you get it, and it looked fun. Like, everybody looked like they were having a good time. It looked kind of like um, in Scream 2 where Stab was being shown and everybody yes. was running around and shit. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, so then Toby explains that each one of these movies was released with a promotional gimmick, which they will be recreating and, and improving upon. 
On one hand, it'll be a total goof. On the other, they're going to scare the living shit out of them. So they take a vote, and the attitude around the room is kind of tepid until Davis says they can make a student film with the proceeds. This gets everyone gassed up, and they all vote yes, except for Maggie, who is storyboarding her script. When they call on her, she agrees as well, and she gives a thumbs up. So next, we get a wide shot of the beautiful Dreamland Theater matinee sign. Um, and it was as funny is this this theater was actually called the Ward Theater in Kingston, Jamaica. And it's in Kingston, Jamaica because the movie was filmed in Kingston, Jamaica. Oh. Yeah. Which mm-hmm. I thought was weird because there was more white people than black people in the audience. And sure. so I wonder what the casting Shout, uh, casting, what do I call them? casting call was. We're was looking for, was for it white like, people on the island. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to make it seem like this is in America. Yeah, and then <laughs> I also noticed a couple of the crew me- or not crew members. I'm sorry, a couple of the extras. You know, the, the the people who were in the crowd were black, but you wouldn't notice because they had masks on. Mm-hmm. And so I, the only reason I noticed it was because of their hands or, or, or whatever, or their arms or something like that. I didn't so, notice that. I, yeah. Right? I was like, they would focus in on somebody who was black. And then I would be like, hmm, this is interesting. I don't know what I was thinking. I was just like, I don't know if I would buy this. <laughs> but yeah, it's something's off putting about it, right? You're like, something's yeah. not all the way right here. And I think, and I think that's what it is. Yeah, and because also like we we learn later on, there's a Jamaican band, like so. Yeah, makes, or, I wish I watched this a second time around yeah. before this. Not sorry, not a Jamaican band, a, a reggae band. Or, or yeah, like but so Toby showing them the theater says, "Welcome to the House of Ushers." Waka waka waka. <laughs> you know what's fucked up is that I really liked Toby as a character. Yeah, and um. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. But. So uh, inside, they all love the place. And Toby informs them that they are going to be its swan song because they're tearing it down in three weeks. Davis is surprised by this and says, are you crazy? We can't be ready in three weeks. Suddenly, a voice from the back of the theater says, yes, you can, because I am here to help you. And it's an older gentleman in a suit, hat and cane, who introduces himself as Malcolm Manessini. And then Toby says, hi, Dr. M. And Dr. M says, hello, Tony. And then Toby corrects, corrects him and says, he's actually Toby, to which the good doctor says, yes, of course you are. And I say, get prepared to love Dr. M because we're going to see a lot of him throughout the whole movie. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, wait, he's gone after this scene <laughs> <laughs> and never seen again. So there's just like a, a dangling storyline just, just there, you know? Right. Because I, I don't know if they meant it as a red herring, because when things start popping off, I thought, oh, wait, it's Dr. M. You know, I don't know if you felt like that. I, no, I was an idiot. I actually was believing what Maggie was saying. Oh, this guy must have survived and it's him okay. doing it. <laughs> yeah. But this is a bit of a whodunit. So that's yeah. where they have a couple people, yeah. So then Dr. M tells them his cargo is outside and they should bring it in and he will be waiting center stage where he belongs. And I thought he was such a great character. Like I would have loved to see him more in the movie, you know? Uh, Yeah. I wonder if they had another idea with him, but they just decided to just scratch that. And because to me, I'm like, okay, but who the fuck is he? Right. Why does he know him? And exactly. why is he willing to? Ha- Where did he come from? How did he pop up out of nowhere at the right time? He has to be working with him. He was like waiting off in the shadows until, <laughs> and Toby was like, "Okay, you're." Th- when I say we only have three weeks, that's when you come in. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I was reading that they actually had a storyline, a, a thread about something about popcorn, but that was actually cut out, and I don't know if it was cut out in the script process or after it was after it was shot, but maybe there was also a scene more scenes with Dr. M mm-hmm. and that was also cut out as well. Like you were saying. So then Davis asks Toby who the hell he is. And Toby tells him that Dr. That's Dr. M from Dr. M's movie memorabilia shop. He has everything they need for the festival. It's like, okay, cool. 
After all the cargo has been brought in, Dr. M flips them open to reveal the treasures hidden inside. He says they're priceless relics of a bygone era of showmanship. Dr. M says he has kept these items since the days of his youth as a manager to a theater much like the Dreamland Theater. Inside the trunks are costumes, decorations, makeup, even electronic switchboards, everything they need. While Dr. M is explaining this, Toby is actually sitting behind him, sitting cross-legged on stage, separated from everyone else. And behind them, there was like a red light. And I thought, okay, they're trying to tell us something here. Yeah. You know? Wow. Interesting. His character was just so quirky. I just would not have guessed. Right? Like, he's the lovable dork that, like, is in love with the main girl, but the main girl doesn't feel the same way sort of thing, you know? So then Dr. M goes on to rail the current state of theaters with the omniplexes with 29 screens, all the size of postage stamps. He says there was more style to getting audiences into the seats back in those days. Dr. M says that the movies they're going to show are turkeys and not fresh ones either. But he's the master chef of showmanship and he's going to teach them how to turn these turkeys into a memorable movie going feast. And I'm like, okay, he's kind of stretching stretching the analogy there a little bit. Mm-hmm. Like, it's okay. You just call them turkeys and move on. With right. It. Seriously. But who calls things turkeys? I, I guess this guy is like 90 years old. I guess he would. <laughs> After this inspirational speech from Dr. M, everyone gets to work setting up for the marathon. Cue the weirdly placed and oddly on point music from, from the reggae band. Yes, that I, I did notice that, and then I was like, "Oh, okay, I'll go with it." Yeah, this is the problem when you write a a song specifically for the movie, as opposed to like, it's like, do you remember Scream Two? Master P had Scream. Oh, uh, I hear him coming. Yes, scream. yes, and he's talking about what happens in the movie. It's like, ah, oh, it's a little <laughs> on point, dude. Uh, so the song kind of goes like Saturday night and I know where I'm going. I'm going to pick my baby up and take her to the picture show. Um, <laughs> picture show. Yeah, it's picture yes. show. So it's so funny, you know, and then that happens a couple times throughout the movie. It's like they play a song and it's exactly about what's happening on the screen right there. And it's like, it's a little off putting. There's a word for that too. And I can't think of the word, but, um, but moving on. And then I say, ladies and gentlemen, we have a montage. Yes. They're sweeping. They're cleaning. The posters go up. Dr. M is pointing at things randomly. <laughs> Bud is hitting the switchboard. Joni and Cheryl are re- revealing the popcorn machine and then staring straight into the camera. For some reason, I don't know why, breaking the fourth wall. And then they got a very cool shock clock that pumps fake blood. I want mm-hmm. that clock. That clock is so fucking dope. Uh, I'm surprised, you know, all these companies nowadays that are like on Instagram, they like make things from horror movies. Like I just saw a woman's, uh, I guess it was a unisex sweater from um, Black Christmas, the original Black mm, Christmas, the one that okay. she wears. It's got, it looks like hands or, or or something like that. I don't know. It's really weird, but I've never seen it before. And now they're making that sweater you can have. So I'm really surprised that somebody hasn't made this. <laughs> made you know? that. And if they did, I'd buy it. I miss, I, when I used to live in Portland, there was because Portland's a little different. So like they still have video stores or DVD stores, or whatever you yeah. Want to call them, but at this specific one, they would have a lot of like replicas from movies. So there was like quote unquote life size a gremlin that would probably come up to my waist if you had like on the floor, like all this different shit from movies. And yeah. if I had the money, I would like to buy that kind of shit. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. We Austin used to have still up until the pandemic two uh, movie rental places. It was I love video and then Vulcan video was the one I would go to. And they closed down after the pandemic, but I just found out the Vulcan video is coming back as a C uh, like a charitable organization, like a not for prop, not, a not-for-profit organization, and I donated mm-hmm. to that so that they can get back up and running, which is going to be great. I, I love that because I would still go rent movies. Like, I'd rent stacks of movies. A lot of these movies you can't find. Like, a lot of the like wh- horror movies never made the jump from VHS to, to DVD true. or Blu-ray, you know? So, uh, and, and still, I just, I support physical media still. Like, I see you have some physical media still back there, and, and I do as well, so... 
it's um a part of the experience is going and picking out the movies like a good 30 minutes of me just browsing shit and then yeah it out is a part of the fun sitting yeah. at home and just clicking play to me doesn't feel the same exactly or like like you said movies just end up on your to watch list and then you never watch them you mm-hmm. know so with with the physical copies with you had to watch them otherwise you're gonna pay for nothing and then exactly. like you know it's a physical thing so anyway i'll get off my soap soapbox i'm an old man i just turned 40 leave me alone so they're fixing up the matinee signs with the name of the festival and then toby i don't know if you notice this toby is the one who's creating latex latex masks of the others which is very interesting yeah as we'll see later then wigs are tried on Great horror props are placed throughout. There's like skeletons, dead things, spiders, all that sort of stuff, et cetera, et cetera. And then we see the giant mosquito that's going to be used later on. It's going to be very prominent throughout mm-hmm. the movie. And uh, then they're testing out the shocks to the seats. And now is a good time to mention that this feels this movie feels like a love letter to William Castle. Right. Are you are you familiar with who William Castle is? So we're talking about like the Tingler and all. That yes, shit. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the Tingler and um, thirteen ghosts. Yes. And uh, um, the 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 House on Haunted Hill, all those movies, where he would he would do these things. He would do these great promotions. Um, he would uh, shock people on their seats throughout the movie. The, this is crazy. Yeah, he had. <laughs> He had ghosts coming out like from the balcony to scare people. They were on wires just like the mosquito. Um, he had the smell of vision. He had to scratch off cards. He had uh, a, he had a movie called Sardonicus where the um, where the audience can pick the ending of the movie. Very similar I to this. Okay, I didn't know about that. So they they were all granted cards. They, everybody when you got into movie theater, were, were they were given cards and thumbs up or thumbs down. And the movie was like a Roman. I haven't seen the movie, but from what I remember, it was like a uh, Roman Coliseum. Like uh, what are they called? Not juggernauts or astronauts. Uh, gladiators. 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 Yeah, gladiators fighting. And the and at the end, you got to choose who lived or died. Either that or it was like if you if we granted mercy to this person, I don't remember exactly what it was. And then mm-hmm. everybody would lift up their cards, and depending on what the audience said, the person in the projection booth would play the different ending to that movie. I love that. Right? That's dope as fuck, right? It, so that <laughs> okay, firstly, I remember when the grudge came out because I used to work at a movie theater. I wanted to try to do something like that. So my plan was to dress up with the long wig. And like the clothes, and like it was the theater that they were playing in had the long steps to go down. So my thought was I could kind of crawl down the stairs, but they said we could be sued if something happened. So that didn't happen. Ah, uh, that's but it would have been perfect because the grudge was scaring the shit out of people in that theater. And yes, um, I would love. I need that. I, I they need to add some shit like that now because I think movie theaters are kind of dwindling a little bit. The experience, so they need to like jump started give us something different yeah i mean it was it was magical like um william castle like brought magic back to movies you know and that's why they made a movie about him a matinee starring john goodman i don't know if you've ever seen that one but mm-hmm. i don't know if it's specifically william castle but it's a william castle inspired type of person but so that's what this movie feels like to me it's kind of a love letter to him because this is all the kind of crazy kooky stuff he was doing in the 50s and 60s so they even try out the odor pellets for the Orobarama, and they try out Dead Dog and Locker Room, uh, which are not smells I ever want to hear. Or <laughs> smells I ever want to experience, you know. So then uh, they also we also get a, a picture, or we get a scene of Toby inspecting all their costumes for the for the night of, and then we see the shot of the matinee as they put the final words in or the for the letters up, and these marketing geniuses. This is what they went with for the title of their horror movie marathon. Special horror, sci-fi, and supernatural film festival, plus surprises. It's like it's really catchy, isn't it, Mike? Uh, it says one night only rated R. It's like they're obviously not taking marketing classes. Um, Maggie, you could have helped them get something better than that. Yeah, right? Put a little effort into it. You put all this other effort into it that you're going to end up with this? Um, so then after finishing the setup, they put everything else in storage 
As they are, Bud sees a film canister and pulls it out, and it says, warning, do not open. Davis says the warning is probably because it was filmed on nitrate and is highly flammable and would explode when exposed to air. Toby opens the canister and finds some film in it, so they decide to run it. <laughs> they got me. Damn it. Yeah. You know that Toby planted this. Yeah. <laughs> as well as we'll probably, we'll, we'll come to find out. But the film is a close up of a man's eyes, then his mouth. Then the man says that he is the possessor, and his, sound, his voice sounds very strange. He keeps repeating himself, and, and the camera is tilting uh, to left and right. So his like mouth is now vertical instead of horizontal. And then blood comes out of his mouth. And then the man pulls apart his scalp to reveal the brain beneath, which I thought looked really cool. It was a good effect. He says, come into my head. Then Maggie suddenly realizes this is her dream. A woman lies on a table as the man from her dream reaches for the sword from that she also saw from her dream. He raises the sword and turns to the woman. But just as he does so, Maggie passes out. Event canceled. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, you're like, no, I'm not doing it. As soon as I realized that is the exact dream I had, I'm immediately, something's off here. I'm leaving. Right. Like, y'all have fun. You don't, <laughs> you don't need me. We've we already everything finished up. everything. Exactly. Yeah. My, wa- my mom wants to take me on a cruise. I'm going to go do that. Deuces, right? <laughs> yeah. So she comes to and everybody is around her. She asks what the movie was and no one knows, but Toby suggests showing it at the marathon. If it's that scary, see, they're, they're they're sprinkling this thing throughout. I feel so fucking stupid. (laughs) (laughs) It's like going back and watching scream and I'm watching, I'm like, clearly it was Stu and Billy like shit. Clearly it had to be two killers because these people could not be that quick. They're not Michael Myers. They're not running. Right. Right. So Davis says the name of the movie is Possessor, made by Lanyard Gates. Uh, He he was the head, apparently, he was the head guru of a film cult in the 60s. And I'm thinking, film cults? That sounds kind of interesting. I'd be down for something like that. So then they, he said that they'd drop acid and make avant-garde movies about people picking their noses and the like. Uh, Davis says he was part of the cult for a while until he actually saw one of the films. He thought it was terrible and people actually laughed it off stage. And then Possessor was his response to the ridicule. He, he goes on to say that Lanyard did not like being laughed at, so he shot all of Possessor except the last scene. The last scene was played live on stage where he murdered her where he murdered his family in front of the audience. Then he set fire to the theater and locked the doors. And a lot of people were killed. Davis says that he thought that the movie burned up as well, but apparently some of it survived. And so then they agree to not show the movie since it's kind of not, wouldn't go with the vibe. Right. Although Lynn was kind of genius, even though it went a little dark. Um, I like the idea. <laughs> yeah. A good idea, right? Back at home. Maggie asks her mom if she's ever heard of Lanyard Gates. Uh, her mom says no. The Maggie, Maggie says she thinks this is the man she's been dreaming, dreaming about. Her mom then suggests dropping everything and going on vacation. Right? <laughs> but Maggie refuses. She says there's something perhaps psychic going, going on, and she can't run away from it. Then Maggie says she's going off to, to bed, and then her mom, Suzanne, gets another call. The weird-voiced caller from earlier again says the ninth circle of hell is reserved for traitors. Suzanne asks who it is, and the caller says he is the possessed. Then he says, soon I will be the possessor. I want her. And this seems to really trouble Suzanne. Uh, and she screams, no! And then he's, <laughs> there's nothing weird happens. Then the caller's like, well, then why don't we talk about it instead? <laughs> Wait, what? What are you talking about? And then she goes. Yeah. But then he says, I am in dreamland. And he says to bring your nasty little gun in case I turn my back again. So apparently Mm. this is, you know, lanyard. 
which is a very weird name. And I don't like having it is it is a weird name. Because the land you're just the thing you put around your neck, you know. I don't like having to say that name throughout this movie. <laughs> so outside of the theater, we see Suzanne arrive in the dead of night with her revolver. The marquee lights up and then the letters start flying off at Suzanne. Then the title Possessor seems to appear ghost like on the marquee. Um how does this work with what is revealed later yeah, on? Yeah, this confused me. I, th- I was like, okay, is this like two-ish trap now? Like, what the fuck is going on? Is this semi-supernatural? Does he have telekinesis? Or is it, I guess, just a trick that he can just shoot shit off of the marquee? I, like, I didn't know. Well, what, even if that were the point. trick, how does he then get Possessor to... I guess, yeah, you just said like with Dr. M's, all that sort of stuff that he's got going on, maybe it's projecting. But honestly, I think this is just a plot hole. Mm. So then the ticket booth comes on and a ticket is spit out. Again, we're going to let it pass. (laughs) As Suzanne grabs the ticket, the door swings open. She walks in and we hear coming soon, justice, retribution and death. The film they tried to stop and couldn't. As Suzanne steps into the th- as Suzanne steps into the theater, previews of coming attractions start playing on the screen, but it's actually the movie The Possessor, just as we saw earlier. Mm-hmm. She says, "No, no, Lanyard." So she, we we know that she did actually know him, and she lied to to Maggie. The film then says goodbye, Suzanne, and I thought, okay, again, how did this happen? Right? Did he record this? earlier and have on one of the masks or again this is another plot hole like th- this is like this feels like they're cheating right like they're telling us it's gonna be this one thing <laughs> but then later on they just cut in that it's actually this thing and it feels kind of yeah. like unfair you know yeah definitely cheating and this is the point i actually really got into it Okay. So I was like, okay. Cause you like the supernatural a, stuff? It's a creepy, yeah, I do. It's a creepy scene. I like what they did with the lighting in this. And when the lights go out, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is, this scene worked. I wasn't expecting there to be like legitimate, like good, well, quote unquote, kills or like scary moments in this. Right, right. Where are we? Okay. So then suddenly the film stops and Suzanne is in darkness. She hears a bunch of scary sounds and then a man quickly runs in front of her. She backs away into darkness, but she sees a man stumbling towards her and she says, Lanyard, stop. Don't think I won't do it. And when he doesn't, she fires the gun multiple times. The man stumbles to the ground and she backs backs away. But suddenly she is grabbed from behind by hands breaking through a screen. Okay, let me repeat that. The man in front of her stumbles down, falls down, but somebody grabs her behind. So that's two people. Maybe that's the guy that was helping the old man. Dr. M? Maybe. Because okay. it looked like an older person that was walking in front of her. But it's never revealed. And Yeah, it is. Yeah. So uh, maybe it's a dummy that he's rigged up somehow. You know, like... I can uh, see that. Again, these are like... Plot holes, you know, but so um, the the scene ends with a horrific looking skeletized skeletonized head with like a green light flashing on it. The next morning, Maggie wakes up to breakfast made and a note from her mom that says, "Tonight's the night. Love you, love you, mom." X X X. This is ridiculous. <laughs> Are we to believe, if we did think it was a ghost, are we to believe that the ghost went to Maggie's house (laughs) and cooked some sunny side up eggs with English muffins, coffee, and OJ? Besides, that's way too much acidity with the coffee and the orange juice. You're going to fuck up your teeth and your insides. Don't do that. So what did you think was happening here? I... So at this point, I was like, okay, it's a mixture of supernatural and a slash. (laughs) Because at that point, I was like, okay, well, clearly this person broke into the house and made breakfast. This was just really fucking weird. And then left a note. And that was, I would find that to be off if my mother was supposed to do that. But Because that's just not something she does. But maybe Dee Wallace was doing that every morning. But it's still weird. And 
you mentioning the plot holes, there is a lot that we're just expected to just, you know, let it slide off our back and just keep going in the movie. Yeah. Knowing what we know now, we know that it was actually Toby who broke into her house and cooked her breakfast without her knowing it, which is very creepy, right? Very. Yeah. And he knows what kind of egg she likes. <laughs> yeah, that's true, right? How does she know? Well, like to be fair, Maggie, it appears that she doesn't even eat the breakfast. She just walks away, which <laughs> if I made you breakfast and you walk away, it's a yes. problem. It's going to be a problem. We know how much eggs cost now. <laughs> and then either way, now it's night outside the theater, and there's a good-sized crowd has gathered waiting to be let in. And this crowd looks so fucking fun. They're all dressed yes. up and ready to go. Like, they're in different, like, costumes, and, like, uh, one guy has an extra head on and that, that barfs. There's ghosts. There's Frankensteins. There's mummies. There's vampires. There's zombies. Just looks like a fun time, the kind of group that you would want to be around. Absolutely. And whoever's job it was to get people to come did a great job because I was expecting maybe 10 people to be coming to this, not a, a crowd full. And later on, somebody says, like, there's a thousand people in that theater. I don't think it's a thousand. <laughs> it's a couple hundred at least. <laughs> so then the, the band again starts to sing another spot on song. It goes... Scary, scary movies on the silver screen. Aliens, maniacs, tarantulas, and brainiacs, and everything in between. Like, I might want to get the soundtrack for this movie. I don't know. <laughs> so, everybody is fucking amped. Uh, then someone asks Bud when the movie starts, and then Bud tells them to check the shot clock. He says, when it screams, a feature beams. And I'm like, sir... Please just tell me what time just, to start. Yeah, Thank you. I don't. I don't have the time for this bullshit. Just fucking tell me. <laughs> so I mean, you're taking it too far, bro. Yeah, I, I need to go get some popcorn and then come back. Just tell me. I do say that, but if I were doing this, I would be in character. In well, you would. So <laughs> you'd be like, "And have a ghoulish time." And you're like, I just want to know what the address of the theater is so my yeah. mom could pick me up afterwards, please. We did a um, 1920s murder mystery party. And so what they did was they would just give you a random character you would have to be at the party. And I was being a little ridiculous. Like I was over the top. I was not getting <laughs> getting out of character at all. So I would be that person. <laughs> You're like, Mike, we're eating dinner now. Please stop. <laughs> stop. <laughs> that sounds cool. Were you the murderer? No, unfortunately. Okay. I think it would be most fun to be the murderer, right? It would be. I think I, I was a film director from California. I don't remember his name. Okay. I've always wanted to play one of those. Uh, we we it's play, fun. it's not a murder mystery, but but we play like a board game called Secret Hitler, which is kind of like Werewolf. Or um, we also play this game called Chameleon, which is kind of fun. And that's where you have to like lie to you are like, for example, in Chameleon, you're the chameleon and you have to lie to everybody else and they have to find out if you're mm. the chameleon or not. So it's kind of similar, you know? Okay. Outside, Toby is helping get people signed up to the liability waiver saying if you get a heart attack that they're not responsible, which this is another William Castle classic that he would do. Um, he signed up people actually to a life insurance policy. Of like, <laughs> so if you died while the, while the movie, you'd get a life insurance. So. That is genius. So Leon is dressed like a psych ward patient in a cage, and he screams, no, don't sign it. Think of your families, mommies and daddies. And then Joni excuses herself and says, it's time for his injection. And he apologizes to, he calls her Nurse Ratchet, but she injects him anyway. And it's all very cheesy fun. Mm -hmm. you know? It's like something you would see at a haunted house. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like a fun haunted house, not one of those like real haunted houses that are trying to kill you, the sort of thing. <laughs> those are like really extreme ones. I'm like, uh, we're like, it can actually you. touch you. Yeah, I'm like, no, don't touch me. I kind of want to go to one of those. You would, but but like they're physical with you. You wouldn't feel like getting physical back. I well, yes, but it, it's weird because I do want. I think it's probably because. I don't like going to haunted houses where there's a lot of people all thrown together and you see everything ahead of time. Uh -huh. So I would kind of want to try one, but with my luck, it'd be 
a real fucked up situation. It would be like Haunt. Have you seen Haunt? Yes. Yeah. Right. Like it would be something that, and I'd be like, well, I knew I should have known. Yeah. All right. So Maggie is manning the ticket booth when Mark appears with his date. She's a bit bothered, but his date leads him away before anything can pop off. Then a strange man in a hat and long hair and bony fingers throws down a couple of like crunched up dollar bills and then takes his ticket and says, will any of these films be as scary as Possessor, Sarah? First of all, I'm not touching that money. Are you, are you touching that money, Mike? No, that's low-key kind of disrespectful. Like, Why would you crumble it up and then throw it on the damn counter at that? And then grab the ticket. I'm like, sir, this yeah. is my job. <laughs> I don't come down to this creep store and be a creep for you. <laughs> I'm taking that out. Cut that. <laughs> so then um, he walks He walks in before Maggie can get a good look at him. And she runs off after him. In the theater, the first feature is starting up. And then they, they play the Let's All Go to the Lobby song, yeah. which I still actually remember from my childhood watching. Yes. I remember specifically going to see dick tracy the one with madonna oh wow and and they played that let's go to the lobby uh before the movie it's cool because you you can sing along to it and i was surprised i like i knew even on its basic words but (laughs) well it's cool because the the draft house um here in austin like i go almost every tuesday for terror tuesday and they'll like show they don't show commercials before it you know which is great is you know, like if you go to AMC, it's all commercials and then twenty minutes. Yeah, all that sort of stuff. Like if it's a new movie, once the movie starts, they're gonna show trailers, like new trailers. But like before the the pre show, they they show like classic trailers from like eighties horror movies, or they'll Ooh. show like weird clips from weird videos, sort of thing. And they they always will start it with a uh, one of these videos from like a different chain, like from. Cineplex Odeon, which is the one that I grew up in, they actually showed one, and it was kind of like this. So it was very, it like it's nostalgia, you know, it's nostalgia, it is. And, 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 and like that. So then, um, in the hall, Cheryl is selling T-shirts, and we hear the shock clock go off, and the blood starts pumping out of it. The first feature is Mosquito. This is one of my favorite parts of this movie of Popcorn. And it's the movies within the movies themselves. Mm-hmm. They were actually directed by Alan Ormsby, the original director. But he was fired from directing the whole feature. But he directed these these mini features. And so they weren't oh. real. So I didn't know. I was wanted, wanted to ask you, did, did you think that they were real? Or did you know that they were fake? Um. Okay, so... Part of me thought, okay, this is an era, a time period where they probably would be able to get licensing, or it would be that like that free to write shit where you could use clips from certain movies and it's not an issue. So part of me did think they were real. I do want to watch Mosquito, and I do want <laughs> yes. to watch the Shocker one. Yeah, the incredibly or the amazing Shocking Man or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, well, the, the special effects were actually supervised by the uncredited producer, Bob Clark, from, from Black Christmas, we were talking about earlier. So I thought that was kind of cool, again, with the, the film's pedigree. And each of these fake films kind of matches the style and tone of the era that they're from, which kind of makes them seem like they were real, like they were real you know. And this kind of reminds me of Grindhouse with uh, Tarantino and... Um, uh, Damn, what's his name? It was Robert Rodriguez. Robert Rodriguez, yeah. Tarantino oh, Rodriguez with their fake trailers, you know? Oh, my God, yes. So the people who didn't get to go see that in the theater, like, watching that is all together is a whole experience. The first movie, the fake trailers, and then the second movie. It was a good time. I didn't I didn't get to, I should have, but I didn't get Because I'm not a big Quentin Tarantino fan. Like, I can understand that. Yes, uh, I won't. I won't go any further. But I, I just say he's <laughs> not. Not. I think he's very obviously very talented, great director. Like, but something personally about him throws mm. me off, especially his use of the N word. That's like gotcha. Just because you're cool with Samuel Jackson, I don't know if like he gave you the N word pass. You think you have an N word pass or something? But like, this should be in every movie. Chill out, like, especially Pulp Fiction. Like, 
he wrote himself into that movie specifically this <laughs> movie, anyway. and he gets a pass. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway. It's it's a very so I haven't actually read Stephen King books, so but I'm finding out that he's using N yes. word in a lot, and normally I would just say it, but I'm just sort of I don't know who's listening to this N word yeah. in his in his books, and I'm like, are there black people in? the area where he's from like i'm wondering if he's doing that because when he was growing up uh, they would be calling people that like sometimes it, it just doesn't make sense like why are you saying this yeah like in stephen king's it okay you had a uh, i don't know a little asshole kid who's trying to beat up mike it makes sense i would buy him being like a racist and saying shit to him especially like in the 50s and 60s or something. exactly but if this, if I don't even see black people in this town, why are we saying this? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, cool down a little bit. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah. So I digress from from Quentin Tarantino talk. Um, so Mosquito is like a fifties atomic insect movie. Like, think them or Tarantula. Those types of movies. Do you like those types of movies? Like, are you into like creature features from like the fifties and sixties or? Or, or, uh, I love creature features. I have not really delved into the 50s. Now, I did try, because I love the blob from the 80s. I Blob's tried movie, yeah. to watch the, the one from the 50s, and I think I did it backwards. I don't think you should watch the one from the uh, 80s and okay. then watch the one in the 50s. Because it just doesn't, it, it doesn't, doesn't match up. Yeah, the 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 blob is a. I like both, but yeah, the blob from the eighties is, I think, the superior one. But they're both fun. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like the um, invasion of the body snatchers. Yeah, there was like the fifties version, then there's like the seventies version, then there's like a nineties version, and I think they're all good. But now that you say that, I like a lot of the remakes, the fly. Invasion of the Body Snatchers, The, the thing. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. one of my favorite. So now that you say that, maybe I should go back and watch all of those. Yeah, they're fun. They're fun. Um, like I don't, I don't watch a lot of them just because, like, I'm not really into. It's not my main genre, but but I do watch some of them. You know. What? By the way, Mike, what's your genre? Is it slashers? Creature features. Really? Okay. Definitely okay. creature features. All right. So it, on the podcast on Scream Kings, like everybody had to pick their franchise. And I was like, I can't do that because, you know, Mark is already doing Nightmare on Elm Street. So I was like, let me just do creature features, especially like 80s. So that was the episode that I had to really take charge. In. So like, I don't know. There's just something about otherworldly things that just is more fascinating to me because there's not like they're evil villains. They're just su- trying to survive. Yeah. But in our, in our eyes, they're villains because they're trying to kill us. And that is, it's fascinating to me. Do you have a favorite? Oh, the thing, the thing is the definitely thing, is okay. thing, the blob. Um, and then even the ones that are not like, like I like tremors. Even, I would consider that a creature feature. Which are tremor. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. I love tremors. Um, Reba McIntyre, that's my girl. I I, I love her so much. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then how about uh, like Critters? Do you like Critters? Critters, Gremlins, Alligator. Um, I do like those two with the regular animals that are kid, like Anaconda, Alligator, Arachnophobe, like all that shit. I like. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, that's good to good to know. I wouldn't have picked. I I, I thought for sure Slasher. For sure no, slasher. I enjoy them. I mean, there is something crazy about an actual person that's trying to kill you. Yeah. But I don't find them as enjoyable as creature features for some reason. Yeah. Okay. I feel you. All right. So then Maggie follows the man to the balcony. uh, And then so once the man sees her, he gets up from the seat and walks away. She follows him to the hallway, but loses him. So uh, back in the black and white movie, a farmer is asking a doctor. uh, Yeah. Asking a doctor what she thinks happened to his sheep. And he says, ain't a drop of blood in him. And she says she doesn't know. And then she notices a large puncture wound on the back of the sheep's neck. And this is so ridiculous because the wound is so huge that she (laughs) should it immediately. And I love that the crowd is laughing at all the parts that I would have laughed at as well. Yeah, Like they're laughing when she notices the wound because they're like, it's so huge. You should have seen this. I love that part of it. It's so fucking meta, you know? 
Um, and I say like this looks like a real movie, and everyone is wearing like mosquito like three D glasses. Like mm-hmm. it just looks like they're having so much fun, and I'm jealous. Exactly. Yeah. So then Mark leaves his date and he goes to find Maggie. On screen, the country yokel farmer asks the beautiful doctor if she thinks there's any connection between what happened here and the underground bombing the army's been doing. (laughs) And then she says, it's our army out there, Skeeter. If we were in danger, they'd tell us. It's like, okay. This is like that 50s, like American exceptionalism, like America, number one. America, can trust them 100 percent trust they the government never do trust anything <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was believable <laughs> yeah because yeah. like we like i've seen a lot of 50s 40s and 50s and 60s movies and that's what it was like you know mm-hmm. all about the nuclear family and god and, and god even plays a part in this movie later on which is funny in this fake movie anyway uh mosquito so then Maggie runs into the projection booth and finds Toby looking out at the film. It's so funny because she was chasing the the man mm-hmm. and she finds Toby. Yeah. She tells him she just saw Lanyard Gates. He's older and his face was burned, but she saw him. And Toby says, how would you recognize him? You've never seen his face. But she assures him that she saw him. She knows it was him. So Toby reveals that Lanyard's body was never found, so maybe he's still alive. Mm. It's funny and, you said you hate his name because they keep saying his name over and over in this over, movie. Over and over and over again. Um, so then she she says, oh, what a great movie this would make. And I love this. I love that she's not scared. She actually is interested and she wants to write about what's happening here, which is really mm. kind of cool that Something you would see, you wouldn't necessarily see in the 80s film or, you know, 80s, 90s film. Then Toby says that she should call the cops, but she says that they won't believe them. So back in the screen, the doctor and the farmer are attacked by a huge mosquito the size of a car. And it actually lands on the roof. And then it sticks its stinger in to the car, through the roof, and into the farmer's head. Yes. And sucks it all out. And it looks fucking amazing. I loved like, it. Great special effects. So, what, yeah, I was going to ask you what you thought here. I love It's cheesy, but I loved every second of it. And I would absolutely watch that. <laughs> I wanted to see more of it. Right? Like, definitely. Like, if this was, if that was a 50s movie, I would watch a lot more 50s movies, you know. Not saying I don't love 50s movies, but this was, it was, it looked great. It looked so good. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was, I was kind of surprised because I wasn't expecting it either, you know? Yeah, when it would put its little, its little arm through the window and they'd have to roll the window up really quick. And then like, and just, some ooze was coming out yes. of it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It reminded me of The Fly, like you were saying. Outside, Toby locks himself out. Very convenient that he uh, yep. goes and disappears for a while. So then a random man takes Mark's seat and Mark's date doesn't stop him. Um, So back in the projection booth, Mark sneaks up on Maggie and scares her. And when he does, like she tips, she goes back and knocks him on his ass, like hitting his nose a little bit. That's like the first of the many injuries he's going to be receiving. (laughs) Yeah, He's doofy. Yeah, exactly. Right. Or doofy. One or the other. (laughs) So then on the screen, the love story between the doctor and the the army man blooms, which is kind of what you would see in like 60s, 50s movies. Up in the catwalk, Cavis, sorry, up in the catwalk, Davis is readying the huge mosquito to fly through the audience to scare them. On the screen, the army man, for some reason, has a direct line to the president and he tells him, Mr. President, call in everybody. This is one big bug. And the, just at that moment, the mosquito crashes through the window and they're all scared and they start praying and the prayer actually scares the mosquito away. <laughs> and I thought it's so spot on. Like they have the attitude of the era down. You know, I loved it. What did you think? 
Uh, yeah, that was cool. I immediately thought of The Mist when I saw that with the crazy religious woman. This is and how she's, Yes. And she's trying to explain away everything and justify other things through this. And I was just thinking, this reminds me a lot of that. The thought of prayer. First of all, the fact you think an insect is going to like retreat because you're praying is just funny to me. Yeah. But let's go with it. Sure. <laughs> So then the fighter jets arrive and they start hitting it with missiles, but they say nothing phases it. And then the army man says, well, we're going to need to drop the A-bomb. And the woman says, no, that's what started this in the first place. But they drop the A-bomb on it and then they duck under their desks for safety, <laughs> just like you see in the, you used to see in those old like safety videos, you know, where mm-hmm. you're like, what the fuck is going under the desk with a fucking <laughs> atomic bomb? But that's like, it feels like propaganda. It's very much propaganda. It, it is. Yeah. So um, just at that point, Davis releases the huge mosquito on the audience. And they go batshit crazy for it. They love it. They're throwing popcorn and candy at it. They're trying to grab it. Like, everybody's up out of their seats. Um, like I said, they just love it. But suddenly, Lanyard shows up with another controller. And... He, um, the, the mosquito is now back up in, in the um, balcony and he releases it again. And the mosquito flies down towards Davis impaling and killing him immediately. And I thought yeah. it was a great kill. It was a it pretty, was. very interesting kill back in the movie. They say it's dead. And then in real life, we, we pull away from Davis who's on the ground dead. So we were going like back and forth from the stage, from the movie to real life mm-hmm. sort of thing then the strange man drags davis's body away into the dark and then mosquito the movie wraps up cheesily on the big screen with a kiss and then one of the men says amen <laughs> and the crowd the crowd loves it the crowd is like laughing at it all right somewhere in the bowels of the theater the stranger is making a mask of the dead davis's face it looks like a very involved process with machines and steamers and the like, but it also looks really cool. Later, Maggie is trying to explain what she thinks is happening to Mark, and he's being an asshole about it and not really trying to understand. He goes, oh, really? That's what's happening? Oh, really? And it's like, <laughs> fuck you, man. <laughs> Um, but at the same time, she 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 kind of just says that she knows things are happening without any evidence and can't explain them. So I'm not sure how I'd react. Like I wouldn't be a dickhead like that, but also at the same time, I'd be like, uh, I don't know. She was she was kind of laying it on thick. She was like, maybe don't bring up Lanyard still alive. I would just say maybe there's a crazy person in here doing shit. That that to me is more believable than someone that someone happened to mention earlier in the movie is still alive and trying to do shit here. Yeah. Yeah. Suddenly Toby shows up angry, asking if they enjoyed their little joke, um, unlocking him out of the theater. He says he had to climb down the fire escape and into the side yard. And they say it wasn't them. She says it was probably lanyard, but Mark doesn't believe her. And she tells him to go fool around with joy instead. So then the next movie starts. Attack of the Amazing Electrified Man. That was the name. Yes. Of it. Maggie returns to the ticket booth and Mark returns to his seat to find the this big motherfucker in his seat. And the guy says, Eat shit, asshole. And he says, You want you mind repeating that, buddy? And he stands up and tells him to eat shit again. And then he punches the shit out of him right in the yeah. face. First of all, fuck that girl. And second of all, yeah, she's toxic. Like, you just let some guy, random guy take my seat and his arm is around you, like, stroking your arm. What, how fucking weird is that? Yeah, she's all about, like, I mean, she's just toxic. She's to- He needs to be, he needs to stay with Maggie. You know, she, she's, she's. Yeah. Uh, actually, I don't even want him with Maggie. Thank you. Thank he you. He needs to be what? by himself. Exactly. She's <laughs> focusing on her career right now and school and stuff. So you're on your own, buddy. <laughs> So then Tina goes looking for Davis and finds Bud trying to figure out the shock board on his own. Back on the screen, a doctor is explaining to a man on death row that the doctor wants to inject him with some corp 
corp muscle, corpsal. I forget what it's. Yeah, something can't pronounce like it. Corpsal. I was like, how did he know this word? Yeah, and um, and to see if he can survive being electrocuted. So back in the real world, Maggie is reviewing her tape uh, that she left. Uh, that she left the tape recorder at the ticket booth, and so she's listening back to it, and she hears that Lanyard Gates has recorded something on it saying, Sarah, you are possessed. And so she goes to look for the man again, but she runs into Mark. When she tries to play it for Mark, she sees that it broke uh, when she ran into, she ran into Mark again with a door. And that was another one of his injuries. So they go, so this is a lot of like going to look for people. This little section yes. here, it's like, she goes, to look for Mark, then Tina, then Davis, then, uh, Bud, all, all this sort of stuff's <laughs> happening. So this is really annoying typing out. They go look for Tina to see if she saw anything. And on the screen, a man is walking down to the chair. We see the condemned man walking down to the chair. And he's cracking jokes with the inmates. Um, as he gets electrocuted, Bud starts zapping people in their seats. And he's having a bunch of fun as he's doing it. But the man in the movie survives and starts zapping people in the room. Yes. Um, Tina finds the man dressed as Davis with his Davis mask in the rafters and he goes to kiss him and she notices that his lips are peeling and she asks for a quickie as they kiss his mask starts to peel off and pull away horribly as the man pulls off the rest of the mask. It's she, he, he terrifies Tina and revealing a horribly disfigured and burned face with an exposed nose bone metal wires and terrible scarring. He screams as on the screen, the electrifying man screams out as well. Amazing. Uh, yes. Makeup. Uh, yes. Effect, all that sort of, what did you think here? I, so first of all, I mean, I guess they had the real actors just play like they were the killer in the mask. But right. in my head, I was like, Oh, this is, he's a genius. The fact that he could do mask work like this. And cause normally they don't look, like I'm thinking Texas Chainsaw Massacre is just like a piece of flesh on his face. Right, right, right. right. Versus this, I feel like it was like really great work to the point where I would believe the disguise and like the the mask as they're kissing, stretching as she's pulling her mouth away and revealing his face. He's a he's a really good villain, I think. I think he's a good villain. Yeah, yeah, agreed. I thought he was really um like I don't know why he's not more iconic and more known, more talked about. You know, I guess because he's a killer named Toby. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. It could be that <laughs> he, he might need a different name. Yeah, but this was giving me very much like Wes Craven's Shocker. Mm. Have you mm-hmm. have you seen Shocker? That's basically yeah. what this and Shocker came out. Like oh, Shocker came out in eighty nine. Eighty nine. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so and this movie came out in ninety one, so it's kind of like around this, this the same era, you know, where the the electrocuted man. I haven't actually seen it in a long time, so I, he dies. Does he come? He comes back as electricity. Do you remember? I feel like he's electricity for some reason. I feel like he travels travels. Through yes, shit. I think so too. I need to watch that again because I had fun watching it. That was one of those movies that I saw a bunch as a kid, but haven't seen a lot since. Mm-hmm. So then Maggie and Mark come across Tina, who's acting very strange. They ask her what she's doing up there, and she says she's securing the mosquito. Uh, and then they ask her if she's seen anyone in the booth when she was when Maggie asks Tina if she saw if anybody else came to the booth while she was away. And Maggie says it was just Mr. Davis, but but he just left. So we then see that it was Lanyard holding quote unquote lanyard holding up the dead Tina and speaking for her, but she is dead. And that was very creepy. That yes, was really it was. creepy. They do it was perfect lighting. I don't think I would have bought that. <laughs> Tina was not moving like a real person in that moment. But um I I loved it. I, I just this movie surprised the hell out of me. So these moments where Lanyard or quote unquote Lanyard is doing his thing, killing people off and then pretending to be somebody else. It really kept me engaged in the movie. Yeah. And Mark, you you were saying that you don't know if you would have bought it. Mark even says, Tina looks terrible. (laughs) Right. (laughs) 
Um, and there's actually another movie that came out in the late eighties. It was, um, oh, I might if you haven't seen it, I might recommend it to you. Um, mm. It's called Stage Fright from 1987. Have you seen this one? I don't think I've seen that. It's like a group of actors who lock themselves in the theater for like a rehearsal of their upcoming like production. And there's a, uh, so, a, social, a psychopath, like a, a killer, a serial killer locked in there with them. And so he's on stage and he's like killing people and sort of thing. It very much reminds me a little bit about this oh. because he also like, or they also like use somebody propped up, somebody's propped up body as like, you know, anyway, if you haven't seen it, I might recommend it. I'm going to check it out. And I like a good isolation horror. So them being locked in, I'm already like, okay, okay. I'm going to watch this. I'm going to say that because at the end of the episode, I recommend three movies to you. So uh, th- that'll be one of them. So, okay, cool. So then Mark and Maggie go outside, but they let the door close on them. So they're now, they're now locked out as well. Uh, Maggie says that she saw Lanyard buy the ticket. But Tina says it was Davis who went in, and so she only assumes it was Davis who who made the recording um, on, on her machine. So maybe the person was wearing a mask. But Mark's like, "There's no way there's a, a mask that can be that good." You know, I'm like, "Okay, well, we're well, there is, yeah, there is." So they then see Davis's car, so they know that he's still there. Maggie says Lanyard is walking around disguised as Davis. At this point. It's getting a bit convoluted. Yes. Right? It's starting it to get, you're, you're kind of like, wait, who are we looking for? Who are you? I've like, lost interest, Maggie, of this little mystery that you're going on. I, I'd rather take tickets than, yeah. <laughs> than do all this. Yeah. So then back behind the scenes, Lanyard, dressed now as Tina in the whole like bellhop outfit, Uh, shows up where Bud is and handcuffs him to his wheelchair. She stuffs his mouth with cotton and tapes it shut. She shaves his head and puts lube on it and then puts a leather strap on top and connects it to the board. He then connects the battery to Bud's head and then connects that to the board. (laughs) This I I was like understanding what they were kind of going for, but it was also, this was a bit, a little bit, confusing as well because i'm not quite sure this would work the way they're making it seem like it would work yeah uh, I, i'm not an electrician so i brought it so i was <laughs> like uh, okay, i get that, it that's fair that's fair <laughs> so then lanyard plays a message for bud for, on, on a tape recorder and basically basically he goes the lights will go on in the following order red blue green or Blue, green, red. Uh, He forgets. The important light is yellow. When it turns on, so does he. And on screen, the electrifying man is scorching some gang toughs on on the screen. Um, I thought that the amazing electrifying man looked so fucking good in this. Like you're saying, like, I want to see these movies. They look so fun. Like the, I felt like it was an X Men movie almost. The way he was like getting people out of here with his electricity. Oh, okay, yeah. It, it made me feel like I was watching somebody with superpowers. Yeah, and it, and it's just like when somebody like loves the genre and puts so much care and detail into that. Like these were just movies within a movie. They didn't need to be this good, right. but they made them good, and it added to my enjoyment of the film. Especially when you're like, fuck, I want to see those movies, you know. At some point. I'm wondering how different the movie would have been if that director did this instead of just doing those mini films. That's true, right? Yeah. Because he did a great job on the mini films, you know. Yeah. So I I couldn't find why he was fired. Um, But, you know, it's Hollywood. I'm sure something went on behind scenes. Because how could you see those mini films and think the rest of the movie wasn't going to be great. Right. Right. So maybe he went over budget. Maybe it was personalities. Who knows? But um, back in the real world, the lights are lighting up one by one, red, blue, then yellow. As the electrified man dies on screen, so does Bud. And he's electrified and he's actually tossed out of his wheelchair with all that power. Um, this this death, I was hoping for a little bit more, 
We just kind of saw him shaking a little bit, but we didn't really see anything else happen here. Yeah. So this one felt kind of, kind of lazy. This death. And I was like, is it, I don't know what it looks like in reality when somebody's electrocuted. I was like, are you supposed to glow like this? <laughs> it was like a light blue hue as he was being electrocuted, which is, you know, an eighties, I guess, early nineties thing as well. It was very much like Bruce uh, Bruce Leroy from The Last Dragon. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a great movie. I love it. And I didn't get to see him. I would have preferred to see him literally fly out of the seat, maybe into the audience, but like people would have ran out. So I don't know if that worked. Right, right. You know what? One cool thing that I I, I liked was that Lanyard slash Toby was, he was super focused. He had his revenge. He wasn't taking it out on the crowd. It was just there for a good time. True. In fact, he was trying to, he tried to involve them. He had crowd participation at the end there. He did. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I liked it. You know, it was cool that uh, he wasn't like, it wasn't like he was going to carry them and like lock them all in it. And in fact, well, I guess maybe he might've set them on fire. He just didn't have the chance to. I was wondering if he was going to try to end it like yeah. the same way. Yeah. I'll say. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. I'm getting ahead of myself. So. So then the lights in the theater go out as well. And so while they're trying to restore their power, they tell the band to go out and play. And so the reason why the teenagers listen only to reggae music, as I told you earlier, is that the film was actually shot in Jamaica and this was a local band and they actually contributed to the soundtrack as well. Mm -hmm. But the crowd loves it. They're, They're jamming. They're jamming with them. And I think they know the lyrics to the song. Yes. That's when I heard them singing Yes, they're the singing lyrics. along with it, exactly. So then Maggie get, uh, goes to look for Bud and finds Lanyard instead, sitting in Bud's chair. Lanyard said, Sarah, no kiss for daddy? She says she's not his daughter. And then he tells her to remember, remember the fire, the sword, and now it's time to join your mother. And she says no, and she runs away in slow mo, <laughs> which is a little cheesy. It's really cheesy here. <laughs> but then we see more visions of her nightmare. Her mother was on a table, surrounded by fi- by fire, and then someone scooped her up and saved her. And then she runs into Toby, which uh, time timeline there. She ran so long that she ran in a circle. <laughs> and I just don't know how that works, you know. But she runs into Toby and explains that Lanyard tried to kill her and he's killed Bud and Tina and Davis. But the band is still jamming in the background. And Maggie tells Toby she's Sarah Gates, not Maggie. She's finally remembered everything. Suzanne isn't her mom. She's her aunt. Her aunt saved her from Gates. Toby asks, why is Gate here tonight? Sorry, why is Gates here tonight? And she says to finish the film. To kill her, Sarah slash Maggie. Toby hugs her and says, he's here for her. And um, he says, all the way to the end or something like that, which is true. And then he says, let's, we can go call the police, but first let's turn the the lights back on. And then they have to go downstairs into the basement to get to the circuit breaker. Uh, You you know where it is. You can go do it, Toby. I'm not doing it. This is when I was kind of like, okay, we're doing a lot of traveling in this movie. Like, I like the kills, but there's too much walking from one point to another, looking for stuff, doing, it's like Clue almost. Yeah, exactly. It's like, I I know a lot of times we say movies don't separate, like in horror movies, like go together, mm-hmm. but. They don't know anything crazy is really happening. She's, <laughs> it's like, why are we splitting up if there's no reason in our minds for us to split up yet? Yeah, exactly. Like right now you're still relatively safe. Stay here. You go do that light thing. I'll go call the cops. That's like, yeah. you know, let's do that. But, um. So then Toby falls down the stairs and they get separated for some reason. <laughs> uh, don't know why that happens. But in the dark, so she climbs down the stairs. And this was actually a very creepy, very well yes. done scene. It's in the dark and all she has is her flashlight. And she's flashing it around going side to side. And as she's doing that, she sees Davis. And then she sees Tina. And then she sees Toby. And she's still like yelling out, like, where are you? Or, you know, but, and then 
she backs into Lanyard, who says, welcome home, and then the scene fades. I would have shit myself. I, And he has, like, the Tina wig on still. He looked crazy. This was a great scene. <laughs> it was a great scene. Yeah. I don't do darkness. I don't do people walking and not <laughs> talking to me. I would have lost it. You don't do people. You don't do under stairs. You don't do any of that stuff. <laughs> no, none of it. None of it. Uh, but yeah, I just thought it was a very well directed, very creepy scene, very well acted. Like, just the thought of being in darkness with somebody who's changing skin or changing masks. Mm-hmm. Very well executed, very well. So the lights come back on, and the stench starts to play. It's a Japanese Toho era movie, like think Godzilla, but not not with mm-hmm. like a. Not with Kaiju, but that's that era. Back with Maggie, she's been captured and her head has been put into the machine to not copy her face, but where they where they uh, drop make the latex. A mold of it or yeah, something. the mold, exactly. Where they make a mold of her face. She asks who the person is and they turn around to reveal it is Toby. Toby. <laughs> Now, what were you surprised here? I was. I was also disturbed by his ears flapping as from the oh, sides because yeah, yeah, the mask yeah, yeah. isn't all the way on. But I was surprised. But it's as we're going through this movie now, it's like all of the hints were right in front of us, but I still didn't see it. Now, like because I saw Barbarian. When he fell down the stairs and disappeared, I was like, okay, that doesn't mean he's the killer. It doesn't mean that. <laughs> but of yeah. course, he ended up being the killer, and I was I was shocked, and he was great. He played an absolutely great... Like, you wouldn't think this person that we saw earlier in the movie, who's kind of goofy, like you were saying, is this deranged, maniacal killer, yes. you know? I thought he did an amazing job. And then with... You would think, like, that face that wasn't all the way applied on could look silly mm-hmm. but the way he played it, it it looked it was so fucking creepy so well done but um he says it's toby or very nearly toby and i thought that was a great line great <laughs> line here and oh. the make as we said the makeup and design is so good here and then toby says he's multi-identical or multi-sexual it's like mm-hmm. Okay, they're being uh, and he's clever. Yes, yes. Yeah. Then he's like, "I'm Tina," and then I'm Davis, and then I thought, "You've been around this person for how long?" And he's had this mask on and been plotting on you. Mm-hmm. It's at least been a few months, at least. Yeah, and 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 as we'll come to find out, he's been putting these masks on since he was a child, so he's an expert at them. So mm-hmm. I I don't have any problem thinking you would have known that it was, he was wearing a mask, you know, because he's been doing it. It's not only mask, it's like prosthetics and other sort of stuff, you know? Yeah. He says he can look like anybody he wants to. One of the few advantages of not having a face. Good line. Yeah. And it's giving me very much. um, Yeah. It's giving me like a man of a thousand faces, which was like Lon Chaney. Cause Lon Chaney did all his own makeup from like, from the early days of like silent films and all that sort of stuff. And so he was like a, a his own makeup artist, and he was able to do this stuff. So that's what this is giving me, which I, I really appreciate. I, yeah. I was thinking uh, Game of Thrones. Oh, really? Okay, I've never seen Game of Thrones. That, that sounds interesting, though. Oh, spoiler! Wait, forget I said anything. <laughs> for for me or for I'm never going to. Oh, you're never. <laughs> uh, don't worry about me. I don't care. But if it's a spoiler for others, then I I can. I can yeah, I guess it's a spoiler for other people who haven't watched it. Okay. I guess. I don't know. I'll, it's I'll, been out for years. Uh, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's, if I'm not lazy, I'll... T- spoiler for Game of Thrones happening <laughs> in the next 30 seconds. <laughs> and I'll cut that back in. If I'm not okay. lazy, if you're hearing it in the, in the way it just happened, no, you didn't. Shut up. <laughs> so... He says he's not her father, that her father, in fact, did die 15 years ago in the fire. And she asks why he's doing this. And he says he was caught in the fire, too. His mom was in the cult as well, and she died in the fire. And he lost most of the flesh on his body. Mm. It was her aunt's fault, Suzanne. And he blames her and is angry 
that Maggie wasn't burned as well. And it's such good acting by Tom Billard here. Like this is what I was saying when, when we're talking about him earlier, the way he's playing this, this character right now, it doesn't feel over the top. Like Mm -mm. I'm like in love with this acting, what he's doing right now. I don't What, what did you think of that? I love how he's able to dip in and out because he still has hints of the Toby characteristics. Yes. But then something will be said or happens and then it's like he switches and turns into a crazy person and he can go in and out. But again, like you said, he it's not over the top. It, it's not, you know, like a Nicolas Cage or some shit. Right, right. Kind of performance. And she's, she apologizes and she says, oh, you're sorry? Now don't look at me. Nobody was a child like me. Skin grafts, the prosthetic prosthetic pieces so the other kids wouldn't scream. Like he he and then he shows her how it works. He covers up the what he calls fried egg eyes with contacts, then a new nose, and a lovely chin. And he says it's his scarecrow in Oz face. And he does like a little twirl with his hand. It's like, <laughs> so good, so good. Um and then she says, you're crazy. And he goes, well, yes, that's just dawned on you. It's like, oh, fuck. Okay. The one who knows they're crazy. Right? What? Do you, yeah, exactly. How do you follow that up? You're like, oh, fuck. Okay. Toby explains his plan. He's going to recreate the showing of the possessor, but this time it's going to go exactly as planned. And if that happens, maybe his mom won't die and he won't get burned. Yeah. he's nuts he's nuts but also it feels kind of lazy like can't it just be for revenge yeah like, it should have been that i think the whole end was kind of rushed it seemed like that the motive what his plan was the death everything was like rushed for the yeah, ending. exactly yeah because they kind of recycle a death that already happened right Mm-hmm. And it didn't feel like it was a callback or anything like that. It just felt lazy and uninspired. So, which is kind of sucky because some of the deaths in the movie were fun, you know? Yeah. So uh, Maggie tells him that it makes perfect sense. She's just kind of, kind of going along with it. Joy walks out looking for Mark and then she finds him. He's being helped by Cheryl and Joni for some injuries that he keeps sustaining. Like he's fallen down uh, falling downstairs, he got bit by a dog, like he got cut by barbed wire. Like at this point, they're like, yeah. he's been fucked up. Um, so uh, they're then joined by the big fucker who took Mark's seat. And Cheryl gets between them and says, uh, you'll have to go to through me first. And the big fucker says, he doesn't hit chicks. And Cheryl makes sure he was serious And then he again says he doesn't hit chicks. So Cheryl says that's all she wanted to know. And she chin checks him and knocks him back (laughs) into the column, knocking him out. I love that. I love that so much. And then Joy tries to get in on it. She tries to be a roughneck. And um, she tries to strike Cheryl, but they kick her out and they kick the big fucker out as well. And they lock the door behind him. So there's no way to get out or come in through the front door anymore. So Joy actually told Mark that Toby and Maggie were making out and uh, w- when she came across them earlier. And so now Mark thinks that's, that, that that's what's happening. But Cheryl and Joni tell him that there's no way that that would happen. Mm-hmm. So um, he asks for Toby's address and Joni knows it by heart. Oh, yeah, that's too bad because right? <laughs> I think they would have made a nice couple. Yeah, uh, beginning of the movie, Toby, yes, would have been yeah. great for her. <laughs> yes, yes. So back with Toby and Maggie, Toby reveals that he has put Suzanne in a full body cast. Suzanne says Lanyard was giving Sarah slash Maggie acid and she had to get her out of there. T- this is what you were saying where this is like, he's insane, but he's also like, sparks of of the original toby um toby says liar liar pants on fire (laughs) and then suzanne says lanyard gates was crazy 
And Toby says, I am rubber, you're glue, whatever you say, yeah. bounces off of me and sticks back on you, <laughs> sticks back on you, sticks back on sticks back on you. And it seems to me like he's regressing to childhood. Yeah. Right? Because he's he's trying to get this revenge that he's been plotting for so long from something that happened in his childhood. So he's been reverted back to there. And then he says he basically wants to do it at midnight. So so there's a half an hour to midnight, and he says he still has some time to kill. It's like, hmm. okay, that's pretty good. Toby, dressed in the crazy man outfit, just like Leon, attacks Leon in the bathroom, locking him in the stall with a poisonous tab that somehow also explodes, <laughs> knocking yeah, him out and then killing it. him. You did, I was going to ask you, did I you get, get that at all? I didn't even know what the hell he threw in the toilet. I thought, oh, he's going to lock him in here. Okay, just crawl out from underneath it, but... Then he threw something in the toilet. And then I was like, okay, it's a poisonous gas. I can buy that. And then it explodes. And I was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there's some chemical reaction we're not aware of. But they also didn't tell us that. So um, unless they say it's nitrate, because in the early, early in the movie, when they find the film, they're like, sometimes mm. nitrate explodes. But they didn't say it when it uh, added to water or something. I don't know. It was right. just um, weird. So then Toby goes to meet with Joni, knife in hand, but she asks Toby slash Leon, or she thinks it's Leon, she asks him if he thinks that Toby likes her, and she says she's madly in love with Toby, and he doesn't even know she exists. Toby, not sure what to do with this information, yells, look, I got my own problems, (laughs) (laughs) and runs out. Joni, looking up at God, says, men, admit it. You know you fucked up. <laughs> I just thought it was so fucking funny that Toby was like, oh, fuck, maybe I could have had something with her. Exactly. I, can't, I can't think of that right now, you know? Make sure you express your feelings. It might save your life. Just- yeah. So then Toby goes back to Maggie, and he's pissed, saying, don't talk about love to me. I have to make a movie here. And then back in the theater, they've released the Aroma Rama on the audience. And back with Toby, Toby is dancing with Suzanne, saying all he wanted was a normal life, but she took that from him. And then he says, I'm so glad I cast you in this part. Because <laughs> he's she's cast. And paid. Yeah. So then Mark has made it to Toby's apartment where he finds his landlord. The landlord is angry at Toby, saying he's a lunatic, yelling and screaming all night long. Mark sees articles um, strewn about on the on his walls about Maggie and the fire and about Toby as well, that his mother died in the fire and that he was injured in it. And then there's a picture of Maggie with scissors stabbed through it. He even sees a drawing that Toby did of a scene from The Possessor, but with Maggie's photo on it. And Mark runs back to the theater um, to confront them. The movie has been interrupted by the possessor and Toby is walking down the aisle yelling, boo, just like the (laughs) rest of the audience saying he hates this movie and it's crap. Like there's so much character and charisma in this killer. It's almost like you like Nightmare on Elm Street. He's giving me Freddy vibes a little bit. He is very much so. Yeah. Um. So Cheryl and Joni, in the meanwhile, in the meantime, are trying to stop the movie, but are, are unable to do so. Toby puts Maggie in a dress, just like the one she wore the night of the fire. And Mark, unable to enter the theater, climbs up the marquee and in through a window. And Toby is re- finally ready for the final scene. He picks up the store. He picks up the sword and stabs the body he has on the table, just like on the screen. And the screen projected in front of him is the is the possessor. And so he's behind the screen and the crowd is, you know how it works. The crowd right. is behind them. So just when that scene ends, the screen comes up and Maggie st- starts begging the audience for help. But the audience thinks it's a gag because they've been gagged throughout the whole night, you know? And so uh, Toby is screaming at the audience or yelling at the audience And he asks, should we kill her or should we show mercy to the tender virgin? And they're all eating it up. They all love it. And they actually vote to kill her. 
and they count down to the stroke of midnight from 30 seconds, which the bad guy always just like extends it, right? He should have just, he should have just done it. Well, not that I wanted Maggie to die, but I mean, she could have gone in his- <laughs> <laughs> at this point, right? As long as D. Wallace was fine, I didn't care. True, true. And also Cheryl, uh, what's her name? Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of that, I wonder if there were some people in the group he didn't want to kill off because I feel like he had a plan for almost everyone, but there was no plan for her. For for Kelly Joe Mentor for for Cheryl yeah for Cheryl there was no plan as far as I can tell to kill her. Mm. Um, the one who was in love with Toby he was about to kill her, but it almost good. seemed like he had to, there were maybe people he didn't really like in the group that he wanted to kill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he wasn't bothering the audience, and he wasn't um, like you said, didn't have any plan for these. So I I don't think I'd like to think that. Well. I, I think that if he had completed the scene, he was going to set the uh, the the theater on fire, and he would have killed them. So I think I think he, okay. yeah. So then Mark has made his way to the balcony, and he has to swing down to the stage with his belt using the lines that the mosquito was on, and uh, he crashes down into the uh, like the side of the stage, and a bunch of light bulbs are bursting, stuff like that. And this angers Toby, and he says, you're ruining the scene because he's recording it. He says, you're ruining the scene. No, stop it. And then he walks to the front of the stage, and the mosquito has become loose and travels down the line, impaling Toby, killing him instantly. That fucking prop is so dangerous. Like, who? Yeah. Why isn't isn't the stinger just like foam? Like, why do you have it a sharp metal object? Good point. Where's OSHA? (laughs) <laughs> so then um so the crowd loves it as and they're all hooting hollering and applauding and all that as toby hangs from the air dead so what did you think of this kill this is the one i was saying i felt uninspired yeah i agree i, I first it's almost a recycled kill from earlier in the movie literally so it, it is, is yeah like give me something grand he should have probably burned again i guess in some way yeah and or like maybe it got him in the head or something like you literally yeah. killed davis like this um so that's a bit boring i'm also not a fan when the final girls do not actually try to kill off the villain which i understood she couldn't because she was trapped in this fucking dress or whatever it was but i would prefer if she actually decided fought him off in the end and killed him i i can see that the the only uh the only thing that is kind of a saving grace for me is that mark technically doesn't do anything either like he yeah. just went down the line and that so happened to release the mosquito that killed toby you know like he didn't know that was going to happen right mm-hmm. he even says it later on so later the cops have showed up and cheryl is explaining what she knows and Mark says that he was a pretty lame hero, which so he knows that he didn't really do anything. But she makes him. But, the, but I, I don't like that she has to make him feel better. Like it's not about him, girl. Right. Like you were, you went through this tragic experience. Um, but she tries to make him feel better, saying that he looked just like Indiana Jones coming down the wire, and he says more like George of the Jungle. And then she says, "Did you hear me? Everything is always about a movie to me." And then he says, "Well, let's make the next one a comedy." So she laughs, and then she asks Mark to hold her as the cheesy 80s rap star, uh, as the cheesy 80s rap music starts up, and then it's that scary, scary movie, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and then that's the end. And I did want to say that that song was actually written by the first director, the one who got fired. Um, He's really involved with someone who got fired. Yeah, like why did y'all fire him? What, what was the re- what yeah, was the reason? The deal. <laughs> I in small part of me thinks Maggie might be a little crazy after this, and she might try to kill people and put it in her film. Oh, because she has okay. not had any kind of I, when she found out that I was about to call him Lannister, um, lanyard. Lanyard. Or who she thought was Lanyard was chasing her, even though he didn't run after her at all. But she, her th- reaction throughout this movie, she's never really scared to that extent. Mm-hmm. 
except for one scene. And she doesn't even have a reaction at the end of this. She, you almost die. And your your aunt was in a, some sort of plastered something in there for di- a day, which I don't, I thought she was going to be dead, but that was strange too, that she was alive like that. Yeah. And I just feel like she might be inspired by her reaction by the end of this movie. I like that. I like that. A sequel where she's the, where she's the, uh, the, the killer. Mm-hmm. So then uh, the movie uh, ends and we see shots of the characters throughout the movie with their names on it. It's kind of, I always like when they kind of do that. Uh, that's um, that's shot on the the um, marquee sign that we see that as well. Uh, and so then that's the end of Popcorn from 1991. So, Mike, what did you think of it? It was fun, entertaining. Uh unexpectedly i there were some there was good uh, practical effects um i liked some of the kills i like the characters i wish we kind of got a little bit more of that yeah um i really enjoyed it and i was not expecting to like it as much as i did yeah same like when you picked it out i just thought good 80s cheesy fun um but i I mean, I guess that's what I got, but more than I had anticipated. Um, I don't really have too much to say as far as like wrong with this film. Like we talked about some plot holes and um, some character choices and stuff like that. And, and, and some of, some of the kills were uninspired, but I don't know. I just liked the whole concept. I just Mm -hmm. enjoyed it from, from beginning to end. Like this was a fun watch with your friends type of movie. Yep. You know, I agree. I, and I love horror movies that take place in a movie theater, or at least have one scene in a the movie theater. Yes. So this was great. My only thing is I feel like D Wallace was underutilized in this movie. Yeah. That was my was, only thing. That would have been nice to see her. Like you, she's a horror queen. Like you, she's in the beginning for a couple scenes and then we don't see her till the very end. Right, and she barely talks. I was like, this is just odd for me. What is happening? <laughs> like, yeah. D. Wallace and, is not like in the forefront of this movie. I'm not used to this. And it's not like she. this was before she was a star. It's like 1991. What are we doing? Right? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so I guess that's the, that's the movie. We can jump right into uh, ratings. Um, we do out of five upside down crosses here yes so out of five upside down crosses what would you give popcorn okay so entertainment value is really important to me and this has it i'm going to go can we do halves can, i don't think you can do half of you do halves you can do half <laughs> I'll, um, I'll allow it i'll give it three and a half uh upside down crosses i'll give it three and a half okay I, I would watch movie. it again. It is a good movie. I would recommend it to people. People who I know would appreciate that stuff because yeah. I've recommended some 80s feeling movies to people and like it. So uh-huh. I've learned my lesson. But let yeah, me ask it was you a question. Fun ride. Mm-hmm. Sorry to interrupt you, Mike. Let me ask you a question. Do you think Bobby would like this movie? I think he would like it. Yeah. I think he would. I think so too because the movie we he chose was The Changeling which is an older movie, like 70s, I think, or, or late 70s, early 80s. I could see him not that. seeing that around the time. Yeah, I could see yeah, that. Yeah, and so, and he really liked that one. So I think he'd like this one as well. So, all right. So you give it three and a half upside down crosses. I think I'm going to go with you there. Um, I'm not going to give it four. I think I may be there. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah that's what, that was the thing for me. I was like, okay, I rarely give out fours to begin with. And rarely, rarely give out five. So I was like, okay, I can't give this a four. Yeah. And I don't really know what it would need for it to, maybe I need a little more fighting going on in there. But Mm -hmm. yeah, three and a half sounds right. Yeah. I think just like in the middle there, I think it just got muddled down with having to chase down this person and this person and this person. It's like, you kind of mixed up the story for people when you didn't need to. And it kind of slowed it down a little bit in the middle, but. I wonder yeah. if they needed some more time. Run They're time. Like, we need, yeah. This is at a, an hour 31. So yeah, it's like 91 minutes. So yeah, I, I could see them. 
uh, filling it up for, with uh, filler, you know, using filler. Yeah. But yeah, I think I'll do three and a half uh, upside down crosses as well. It's just a fun time. This would go into the rotation. Like I judge whether or not I would buy the Blu-ray and I would definitely buy the Blu-ray on this one. Um, just a lot of fun. Uh, so yeah. So what we do now, Mike, is in order for you to be fully absolved of your horror movie sin, I need to <sighs> suggest to you three movies that you that you should watch. <laughs> And uh, if you watch them, it's up to you to watch them. If not, then you'd probably burn in the fiery pits of hell. That's not up to me. That's up to you, Mike. So that's on you. That's your absolution. So I wanted to suggest three movies to you. Okay. Um, The first one, I would say uh, Stage Fright from 1987. That is actually, um, it's kind of like a um, giallo. Uh, but from from the late 80s and uh, i think you're really gonna enjoy that one that's a lot of fun that's about a production we talked about earlier it's about a group of people who are like putting on a stage play and they lock themselves in and then a a killer shows up uh the next one i would say fade fade to black from 1980 uh and that's a, a shy lonely film buff embarks on a killing spree against those who browbeat and betray him all the while stalking his idol, who was a Marilyn Monroe lookalike. Oh. Yeah. And then the last one I would say, again, is these are all kind of within the same time frame. Phantom of the Mall, Eric's Revenge from 1989 as well. Um, this one is a man loses his own and suffers life-threatening burns from a fire deliberately set by commercial real estate developers vying for his property. One year later, a shopping mall opens on the land and a series of murders begin. Oh, so it's obviously that. it's like Phantom of the Opera, but it's set in a mall, like a 1980s mall, you know. So that sounds fun. Those are the three movies I suggest, and I uh, hope that you get a chance to watch them and then hope you uh, come back in the future and we could talk about another movie and uh, maybe we could talk about those movies as well. So I hope you had fun, Mike. I had a great time. I will be watching these. I will be back. And I said enough, so I am going to watch these movies. Hell yeah. All right. So, Mike, if you can once again, uh, or actually, Mike, if you can let everybody know how they can follow you, where they can support you, your Twitter, Instagram, all that sort of stuff. Okay. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. My handle is at ThackerayBinks86. Um, That is Thackeray Binks from Hocus Pocus, if you need to know, know how that's spelled. And um, while Twitter's still here anyway, if right. that is going away or not, I don't know. And you can listen to me and Bobby on The People Under the Scares, and that is on all major podcasting platforms. And you can find us on Scream Kings on YouTube, Wednesdays at 8 p.m. And it's very shady. Have a drink or two with you while you're listening. Hell yeah. And I'll be dropping the links to all that, all that stuff in the show notes as well. So Okay. If you'd like to follow me, you can follow me on uh, Twitter at MHCPod. You can follow me on Instagram at MyHorrorConfessional. If you'd like to email the show, you can email me at MyHorrorConfessional at gmail.com. We do have a Patreon. It's uh, patreon.com slash MyHorrorConfessional. Um, the music was done by Taylor Fox. You can follow her on Instagram at the Taylor Fox. Um, she also has a band uh, called Great Hag. Look up her stuff. It's really great. Um, the artwork was done by my friend Cap Mikey. You can follow him on Cap. Uh, you can follow him on Instagram at Cap underscore Mikey underscore Arts. Mike, I wanted to once again thank you for coming on the show. You were so much fun to have. I had a blast talking about this movie, uh, and thank you everybody for listening. And we will talk to you next week. Peace. Later. <laughs>